Welcome, welcome, welcome to Armchair Expert, Experts on Expert. I'm Dan Shepard. I'm joined by Monica Mouse. Hi. Hello. Special day. Very special, particularly for you as a royal file. I can't believe it. <laughs> can't. I still can't believe it, and we did it. Refuse to believe it. Yeah. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Of course, he's a member of the British royal family, the younger son of Charles, Prince of Wales, and Diana, Princess of Wales. Radical dude. So cool. Had zero idea of what kind of guy he was. Yeah. I thought he was going to be a little more um, stiff, like a little bit mm -hmm. royal. Yes. And he was very fun. He was just a rad dude. Before you enjoy Prince Harry, we have an enormous announcement. Yeah. Um, we here, Rob, Monica, and I at Armchair Expert are going to go to Spotify. That's right. In July exclusively, and we will be doing the exact same show you've always loved, or hopefully you love, and we're going to be doing that on a platform with more fun features and more ways to get involved with the community, yeah. and it's going to be wonderful. So if you haven't already, please download the Spotify app. Get and, on that. And listen to us there. Starting in July, it will be the only place you can listen to us. So get on it now. And yeah, same show. And we hope you all join us because we love doing this more than any other thing we do. Yes. Now, please enjoy Prince Harry. We are supported by Brook Linen, my favorite hotel quality sheets to get into and writhe around in the nude. They just celebrated their seventh anniversary and they sent me some cookies. They did? Yeah. What flavor? Linen flavor? Yes. Oh hotel quality cookie. Well, listen, if a lot of your life is still being lived at home, then make your home as comfortable as possible. A refuge, an oasis, your personal zen zone. Go ahead and max out on the extra soft sheets, super plush towel and loungewear. You can get the best of all of it from Brooklinen. I just uh, dried myself this morning on a Brooklinen towel. They really are incredible. They're impeccable. They're decadent. They're soft. They're absorbent. Brooklinen was started to create beautiful, high-quality home essentials that don't cost an arm and a leg. They're so confident in their product, they come with a 365-day warranty. So give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it for less. Go to brooklinen.com and use promo code EXPERT to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of a hundred dollars. That's B R O O K L I N E N dot com and enter promo code expert for twenty dollars off with a minimum purchase of a hundred dollars. That's Brooklinen dot com promo code expert. He's an armchair expert. What's your feeling about Joe Rogan's comments about vaccinating? Ridiculous, obviously. And I side with yeah. him. Get comfy, though. We want yeah, you to be yeah, relaxed. Yeah. There, yeah, it there it is. Yeah, there it is. There we go. <laughs> so I think what he said was ridiculous. And I also a little bit agree with him. Like, I fucking call fights. I'm an MMA announcer. I'm not Fauci. No one should be listening to my opinion on medical shit. So no. I agree with both sides. Like, what he said was stupid. I think the issue is, like, in today's world with misinformation just, oh, yeah. like, endemic, Yeah, you got to be careful about what comes out of your mouth when it comes to that. Because news doesn't exist in just news anymore. Yeah, you're yeah. totally right. It's splattered right. all over the place. So yeah. people, like, listen to Joe Rogan and say, oh, if he says that, yeah. then maybe I'm... Um, and it's... You're right. There's a sort of, like... Don't listen to me. It's like, well, don't say that. Just <laughs> yeah. stay out of it. Exactly. <laughs> and just acknowledge you are a person that people listen to. You are. And if you have a platform, exactly. with, a, with a platform comes responsibility. I, but I like, agree. It is all very tricky. So like Oprah famously got sued by the meat industry for talking about uh, mm -hmm. mad cow disease. This is how her and Dr. Phil met. And part of me was like, yeah, she has a huge platform. And also she can have a fucking opinion about shit. Yep. She's not like legally responsible if you decide to stop eating meat because of her opinion. How about this? What if I say when I was single, I didn't wear condoms as much as I should have? Like, has that become a thing that people... I'm no, not advising no, anyone no, not to. You didn't, you didn't do it as yeah, much as you should have. Exactly. Oh, there we go. Should have. Should have, yeah. Oh, so okay. you, can, you can certainly share the opinion and say, this is my opinion. Uh-huh. But... And I recognize it was stupid. Yeah, the implication is you should have done something different. That's true. Again, all comes, to, <laughs> all comes down to being responsible. Yeah, remember when we had the guy on... We had someone on who wrote a book called Hooked about the food industry and it was crazy he was like the same people who are selling you 
whatever the processed food have an investment in the oh, yeah. pill that well, will. he was saying specifically like they create this huge problem with overly sugary foods they also offer you the antidote which yep. is sugar-free food it's yeah, a good but... business plan like if <laughs> i were an investor <laughs> and you brought it to me it's smart there's no denying that yeah but supply and demand right mm -hmm. by the way i have a libertarian bent to me i have an individual rights bent to me and i used to think that until i learned that if it were a fair competition yes so if it was just this food tastes delicious and it's on you to not eat a bunch of it but once i found out they're employing the world's best chemist to not just design a good taste, but a taste that dissipates really quickly so that you desire another bite quickly. Like, you're outmatched in that situation. It's not a fair fight. It's like the algorithms on the internet. You can't compete with that, a human. You can't if you have the awareness of what it's doing to you and the fact that it's learning. Yes. Right, which is scary. Exactly. Yes. And advertising has been going on for hundreds Full of years. Full-fledged for 100 years. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. but done really responsibly. The difference here is targeted ads. If ads have always worked for companies, yeah. you put it on the TV, you can walk away, you can come back. Your involvement is switching on, switching off, or changing the channel. Whereas now with algorithms, it's there. It's just feeding your habits, and it's also reading through your emails and everything oh, else. Yeah. So it's getting to know you. Like It gets to know the decisions that you're going to make before you make them, and then it creates this echo chamber of no pushback, of no context, of nothing. It's just perpetuating and feeding the bias and the habits that you already have inside of you. Which is terrible. Yeah, and yeah. if you if you were asked <laughs> so what you were going to do next, and then you asked the algorithm what you were going to do next, the algorithm would be right like three to one. Yeah. So that's why it's not a fair fight, because you can't remember everything you've done in the last 12 years. Yeah. But Google knows what you've done for the last um, 12 years in a nanosecond. And I think they get to wash at the moment, until it changes, at the moment they get to wash their hands of, of responsibility, because it's like, oh, it's not human error. It's mm -hmm. a computer. It's like, yes. but who wrote the algorithms? Yeah. You guys did. Yeah. Exactly. Pretty soon the algorithms. Probably all male and all white. Yeah. Yeah. Likely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here we are, you and I, a couple of white males. <laughs> pontificating. Luckily, Toya and I are here. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'm so excited you're here. It's very flattering that you came down from Santa Barbara. Like, you had I to know, fucking work it. to get here. That's all right. I just sat in the back, did a little bit of work, read my notes. And perfected the algorithm. And perfected the algorithm. <laughs> Gave them more data. Exactly. I didn't expect to come into a building site, though. Mm -mm. Yeah. Most people don't. That wasn't in the brief. <laughs> I left that part out. I expected better. <laughs> I'm really excited to meet you because in full disclosure, I'm the most ill-informed person on the royal family, at least in my circle. You're the only one I ever knew. It's simply because you were in those awesome nude photos in Vegas. <laughs> and I literally said to myself, this guy's a party. Yeah, he has said that many times. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So you're look constantly looking for other people to go sort of balance out your own behavior, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's relatable. <laughs> truthfully, truthfully. And then on top of that, I was like, God, this motherfucker's got a good body. You are in tremendous okay, now it's shape. Getting, now it's getting weird. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, oh you, we haven't touched weird yet. <laughs> that was a few weeks before I went to Afghanistan. This is the other reason I knew you is because I was there in 07 doing a USO tour and the big hubbub was that you were going to be arriving. Okay. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, they send princes into battle. I did, I did not realize yeah. that was not what I thought happened. So much for keeping it quiet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course everyone knew, right? Look, at least I wasn't running down the strip. Stripping, albeit all naked. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at, least. That, at least. <laughs> you could have been one of the dancing boys of Afghanistan. We Do you should know about show that? the prince the calendar. Where is it? What calendar? You think that's going to make him feel more comfortable? Well, yeah, because I don't want him to think it's just <laughs> oh, him. Oh, yeah, it's not you who I'm just obsessed with. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Monica makes this for me every year, and it's a calendar of all my favorite bodies of um, and they're my all friends. Men. They're all men. And they're all gorgeous and, bodies. Yeah. Why am I not September? Exactly. Uh, well, okay. next year. The, next year, yeah, yeah, we'll find that. That's so a, why is it on September? Can I tell you who that is? <laughs> this is obviously a clear favorite. All <laughs> mm. oh, right, because you're born in September. Exactly. Who is this guy, though? That's Kumail Nanjiani. You know Kumail, mm, don't you? You no. might not know. Silicon him. Valley. Did you ever watch Silicon Valley? Yeah, he's. No, of course I haven't. Oh, <laughs> I, of course I haven't. I recognize his abs. <laughs> Very notable abs. Oh, so that's. <laughs> That's an inside joke. So my friend Tom <laughs> Hansen, who I worship, he's 72 and he's my idol and my de facto father. He's got the most enviable hair of what? anyone I know. Look, that's a 72-year-old head of hair right there. What's weird is everybody else is showing their abs and then he's just showing the top that's of his right. head. It's kind of things I covet. Who's this? Oh, so that was an AD on a show I was on, Nick. 
who just was inordinately jacked, and I was obsessed with it. And he accommodated Monica. I did a lot of very uncomfortable texting to get this calendar <laughs> made. Like, hey, is there any way you could send me a picture of your a torso? Picture of your <laughs> torso. naked body. <laughs> you can pick the part. Whatever you feel looks best. And now that you're so, in our like, sphere, you're the one who asked to ask the question. Well, it was a surprise gift. Yeah, I don't, I don't ask for this. This is just a <laughs> okay. benevolent gesture by Monica. And now that you're in our sphere, you're fucked because she is going to ask you for That's something. Right. No, wait, next wait, year. You can have the top of my head. <laughs> it's bald and it's ginger, but you can have the top of the head. <laughs> okay, so I want to know: Are you nervous to do this interview? Well, I didn't know it was an interview, so it's not. Conversation. It's a chat. <laughs> yeah. Was I nervous? No. I not so much nervous, but I guess on this particular subject around mental health, yeah, for me, it's always a, unfortunately, the, today's world is quite a sensitive subject, not just for the people who are sharing, but ultimately the subject matter itself has to be handled with care. Yeah. There can be humor, there can be everything else, but when it ends up getting weaponized by certain people. Headlines, also, yeah. Yeah. You can never predict it, though I probably, in this instance, you probably can. But that doesn't worry me anymore. I used to be fearful of it. Yeah. But now it's almost like the same groups of people that come at it so negatively or try and turn it against you or weaponize it mm -hmm. and therefore affect so many other millions of people from doing so yeah actually encourages me to speak out more yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. i guess that's probably the same with you guys and the same people that sat in the same chair which is like look i'm gonna be vulnerable if i get attacked for it let's see who's actually attacking me Yes. Um, yes. What's yes. their story? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's their agenda? Mm -hmm. Right? Who do they work for? It actually mm -hmm. says more about them than it does. But that's, that's how I've always felt when it comes to the project. I mean, hatred is a form of projection, right? Yeah. We're not born to hate people. Yeah. So it, it manifests itself over a period of time. And of course, it can come from unresolved pain mm -hmm. or being hurt continually as a young kid or through your adult life. But ultimately, it, there's a source to it. There's a reason why you want to hate somebody else. Yeah. And when it comes to trolling on social media, the best way that I look at it is like, okay, take a moment, be aware of what this is doing to me and how it's making me feel. Yeah. But then look at them and go, how's your day going? Yeah. yeah. And actually have some compassion for them, which is really hard when you're on the receiving end of this, like, just vile, toxic abuse. But the reality is, as you say, flip it. Yeah. Flip it and say, what happened to you? Yeah. What made you want to come at me like that when clearly we've never met? You don't know me. Like, what's your goal? What are you actually doing? I know it might make you feel better in the moment, but long term, it's not going to help. Okay, so where I come from in working class Michigan, I think my fear of sharing about like being molested or violent stepdads or all the stuff I went through, my fear was like those people will be like, oh, my God, you need so much attention. Like that I'm mining it for sympathy or attention, which I'm doing neither, but that was maybe the hurdle for me to get over is that that voice – of my peers at home, what would they say that I'm just yeah. attention seeking? What are yours? Like, what is the thing you go to from your childhood or whatnot, where you can hear people saying, like, stop um, being a baby, stop? No, I think more like, oh, you need help. As a case of not so much weakness, but, oh, I don't, I don't know how to deal with this. You're unhinged or you're not particularly well. Go and seek help. And it's like, well, rule number one is when you actually want or feel as though someone needs help, telling them to their face, you need help <laughs> is probably the best way for them to go, uh, no. No, I don't. No, I don't. Yeah. Object, run away, exactly. delay, all these kind of things. Or go and drink or take drugs or whatever. You yeah. find a different way. Take your way. clothes off in Vegas. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Any single one of us, whoever we are, wherever we come from, they will always try and find some way to be able to mask the actual feeling mm -hmm. and totally. be able to try and make us feel different to how we are actually feeling, perhaps having a feeling. Yeah. Right? Because so many people are just numb to it. That was a huge part of the beginning of my life, which was like, I rejected it. I said, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. Yeah. Well, there's a male component too, don't you think? Like Huge. Yeah. I know for me, where I grew up, any emotion was weakness. And weakness was cancer. Yeah, true. But look how much the world has changed now. I think the worse the world gets or the harder it becomes and the more suffering that there is, the more people feel as though they have something relatable within their community to their neighbors or perhaps online. Yeah, yeah. And that's creating a change of the conversation, certainly through this series that Oprah and I are doing. As far as I've viewed it for many, many years now, and we're very vocal about it on the series, which is speaking out, especially now in today's world, is a sign of strength rather than a sign of weakness. Yeah. So if you are making that conscious decision to say, you know what, it's not self-serving, but I want to share my story. I'm being asked to share my story mm -hmm. to hopefully help someone or loads of other people. 
I'm probably going to get trolled. I'm probably going to get attacked by the same people that would do it anyway. If I'm willing to make that decision, surely that comes from a place of courage rather than weakness. Yeah, well, yeah. for sure. The easy thing to do is, yeah, is to stay quiet. You know, the fact that you guys are doing this series, The Me You Can't See, which you produce with Oprah and you guys conduct interviews, what I loved immediately is on the surface, you two have as polar opposite of childhood environments mm -hmm. that two people could have. I mean, literally, if you had to build a spectrum, Oprah would certainly be towards the tail of one end and you mm -hmm. would certainly be towards the tail of the other. And yet what I love about it is trauma, loneliness, all these things, they transcend that whole spectrum. And if Oprah's at one end, I'm in the other based on my privilege and my upbringing. Yes. And Oprah's at the opposite end, then every single one of us is somewhere along there. And by the way, I truly believe that you can move along the spectrum as well, right? Wherever you were born, you may start in one place, but that will change over time. Well, you guys are almost flipping, maybe. Oprah's going to end up <laughs> <laughs> Oprah's gonna end the queen, the queen of America. And Whoopsie. Uh, share, <laughs> sharecropping. Uh, no, you'll meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> uh, well. But I think that's, that's exactly it. That is about meeting in the middle. Well, one of the main reasons of the series is to be able to have these honest conversations with people around the world who have suffered and are continuing to suffer in some instances is about stripping away all of the not so much the labeling, but our backgrounds and the privilege. Because again, within certain corners of the media, it's very much like, you're privileged. How could yeah. you possibly be suffering? And it's like- Can I interject yeah, and just go. say that I have unique compassion for you because I feel like if I were you, I would feel not entitled to share my experience, that I would be judged as someone who was just not grateful or that had it made and was still complaining. Like, I think- weirdly it is easier for oprah to come from where she came from and tell you about her trauma than for you to say you know what it wasn't fucking great yeah because yeah, people are like what you grew up in a palace yeah 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 like, how yeah. bad can it be exactly. yeah you had like people like running around <laughs> doing this you had especially in today's world and believe me look all of us have seen suffering mm -hmm. and i've luckily because it's been part of my own growth have spent many many years traveling around the world seeing other people suffer mm -hmm. and being able to have that empathy for them, the ability to put myself in their shoes. Yeah. That was the education that I had. So the weird thing is that, yeah, I was born into this privilege, but the privilege also gave me the most unbelievable front row seat front row seat and education my education is not in in school my education is about being about meeting people across the commonwealth right 52 yeah. countries 2.4 billion people 60 yeah. percent of that 2.4 billion people under the age of 29 like everywhere i go i ask questions everywhere i go i try and listen yeah i don't want to come in and say these are what i think my solutions are like i already know they're probably looking at me going you're a prince, you come from a palace, where's your crown and where's your cape? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, kids. Yeah. There is no crown. When's the no, dance? No cape. They're like, when's well, the ball? I don't ball? want to speak to you if you haven't got a crown. <laughs> Bye. And off they go. But the reality is that you meet these kids and you go to these communities all over the world and it just puts it into context. Yeah. And that's why I feel more comfortable now being able to talk about my own struggles because I do it to help other people. Yeah. I don't see it as complaining and I don't think anyone should see yeah. talking about your own issues as complaining. Well, it's about sharing your story, knowing that how relatable it is because you will, I guarantee you, by sharing the vulnerabilities and experiences that you've had growing up, there will be at least probably depending on what platform you're using, whether it's podcast or otherwise. Yeah. As long as I keep it off Twitter, it's positive. Exactly. Yeah, but, you're, but you're going to have a positive impact on someone's life. Yes. Uh, someone feels seen. They don't feel alone. It all is wonderful. Now, I think you and I are also in a really unique situation as well. Like what you and I have had a really firsthand experience with is like, oh, the shit that's sustainable, the foundation for self-esteem, all those things, sadly, they don't really derive from all the status stuff that I bought into as a kid and that you were just inadvertently born into, which is like mm -hmm. all these things, the kind of dream we've been sold. I just like saying out loud, like I had made the most amount of money I ever made. People recognized me at the airport and I was on the verge of killing myself because I was such a bad addict. Life was miserable. So like I had all the things that are supposed to make you happy and it, it just didn't fucking work. So you were chasing something. Yes, the thing I needed wasn't the things I thought I needed. Like the things you need is like connection to community, being of service to other people, things that are actual self-esteem builders, not mm -hmm. accomplishments or adoration. Those things, at least for me, didn't fill up or give me the esteem I needed. But being catapulted into fame yeah. was presumably a hell of a lot to deal with. And yeah. Did you have anyone around you at the time guiding you or 
giving you advice. Oh God, no! I had a bunch of my, me and my fun, my friend, well, a the bunch the of bo- us, the bottom of the bag. <laughs> yeah. the, the, all of us super excited to get into nightclubs, and people knew us, and hot girls liked me. All of a sudden, like the whole thing was really thrilling yeah. for about six months. But it's not sustainable. Yes, and then what really starts happening is like I'm still looking in the mirror in the morning, brushing my teeth, going like. Well, I'm not seeing the person they're seeing. These yeah. people who love me, I'm not that person. Now I just feel like a fraud. I feel like I don't deserve it. There's just a million feelings, none of them good. But do you remember or do you have awareness to what the reason for the drugs and the drinking was, apart from having a great time and <laughs> now knowing that you can afford it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Touching on what we talked about at the beginning, yeah. like there's a reason for that. And for you, you, it was your upbringing and everything that happened to you, the trauma and the pain and the yes. suffering. Yeah. All of a sudden you find yourself doing a shitload of drugs and partying hard. Yeah. Look how many other people do that as well. They wouldn't necessarily have the awareness at the time. I certainly didn't have the awareness when I was going wild. Yeah. Like, why am I actually doing this? Yeah. In, in the moment, it's like, well, why not? It's fun. Right, right. You, in you, my 20s, that's you, what you're if, supposed to do, isn't if it? If asked, you would say, oh, it's fun. Yeah. But now you read, I'm sure, Oprah's book, which is great. What happened to you? I haven't read it yet, but I know. Okay, I know. you're going to love it. Listen to it on tape. That's what I did. I don't know why I told you that. Maybe enjoy reading. <laughs> 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 I assume they taught you how to read. Um, <laughs> there's so many layers to it. So, of course, I later came through sobriety, realized like, oh, yeah, I was trying to regulate internal feelings with external stuff. Yeah. So I had that awareness. But after reading her book, I realized like, oh, no, when you grow up with six or seven aces, childhood traumas, yeah. there's like a questionnaire of 10 of them. I think three or more, you're 70% chance of being an you addict got, or whatever. You six. Mm-hmm. So now I realize Oh, aside from trying to regulate, I can't regulate. My body gets into a very agitated state quite easily because of all the stuff from childhood. And that's just my biochemistry now. Going forward, there's a physiological component to it that ends up happening. But now you know what's happening. You can recognize in your body, and then you can regulate from there. Yeah. The awareness helps. The awareness helps massively to be able to listen to your body. Otherwise, you're just tearing around. Or the way that I described it is basically having your head in the sand with your fingers and ears going, la, 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 la. And you'd think you're cruising. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also cortisol that's playing a havoc as well. Yeah. And then the adrenaline part, which is just driving you, giving you this extra energy. And okay. to some extent, I know I've been there, maybe been there as well, where you think so... Whatever this is inside of me is really helping. It's driving It's fuel. Me. Yeah. It's fuel. Yeah. That's where the sort of the burnout happens because it's like this isn't normal, uh. but it feels great because I can get shit done. Yeah, super I can, I can work harder and all that. And then eventually it suddenly hits you and it's like, that's not sustainable. Yes. There's no way. But it's fight or flight, right? Okay. Let's go back a step. Okay. Your parents. Generally, I provide I therapy like, to yeah, the guests. I know. I feel like it's switched. All of a sudden, I just saw that. Like, oh, he's the therapist today. It's, it's, to me, it's always so fascinating to hear of someone's struggles and for them to be able to explain or articulate why. Yeah. But then also tracing it back to, okay, back to the sort of what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah so what happened is my parents got divorced at three. My dad became pretty irregular and undependable. Mm-hmm. I didn't see him very often. My first stepdad was a violent cocaine addict that beat my mother in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I desperately wanted to save her and couldn't, which then predicted my long career as a bar fighter. Anytime I think someone needs to step in, that's my calling. Yeah. Then another stepdad who was type A marathon running engineer controlling, he and my brother fist fought. He knocked my brother out. I thought he was dead. My brother got th- sent to my dad's. My dad and my brother fought so bad, they broke the coffee table. My whole neighborhood was gathered at the end of my driveway. I walk in, both my dad and my brother are bleeding profusely. My brother's telling me, pack your shit, we're leaving here. Like, this was just all the time. It sounds like the script of Step Brothers. (laughs) Yes. uh, (laughs) The non-comedic version of Step Brothers. (laughs) Golf club over the head. That's that's. And then molested uh, molested along the way. And, uh, you know. Just just, just throw that in. Just a cherry on top. (laughs) Yeah, a little icing on the cake. When we left my dad, my mom was a janitor on midnights. My little sister was born. I was helping raise this kid at six years old. My mom was way stretched beyond what any human can handle. She has depression. You know, everything you can have, an addict in the home, a mental health issue in the home, violence in the home, sexual abuse in the home. So, yeah, I think all those things added up to I love Jack and diets and cocaine. That's a lot. I'm beautifully summarized. If you don't mind me saying, I really, I like, I, I feel like I really know you now. Okay, thank you. Like, what was the trigger for you to go? Hang on a second. Well, it became obvious. A, I literally couldn't quit drinking. Like, I think a lot of people think, like, oh yeah, I could or I couldn't. But 
if you've tried several, several times and you literally get the point where you're like, holy shit, I, I am incapable of this. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to disappear for four or five days at a time. I'm going to be in these dangerous drink, situations. Drinking for breakfast as well. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And then I'd level out Wednesday, Thursday, and then just start it all back up Friday. And then tons of drugs, every drug at all times. By yourself or with friends or both? It always started socially, yeah. and then it always took me to where I ultimately desire to be, which is completely alone doing drugs. Lost man standing while everyone else is. <laughs> yes, like, yes, just, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And then he tricks himself into saying, like, I'm the one that can handle it. I have the constitution to handle it. They don't. Not... I have a problem and they don't. <laughs> right, right, but right. in that moment, were you doing it for fun or were you doing it to mask the pain? So what is now obvious is the reason I couldn't shut it down and other people could. Now I recognize the thought of returning to the other feelings, yeah. I'd rather be dead. Yeah. Like now I recognize that. Like yeah. In the moment. Not, no, you don't realize it. Don't like, like we had a guest on who she and I kind of connected quickly. She didn't even articulate it, but she mentioned crack houses and I'm like, Oh, yeah, I've been in some crack houses. And then after that interview, I was thinking, it is weird what danger you'd put yourself in. But then recognizing that all you've really done is prioritize your emotional safety over your physical safety, yeah. which then makes sense. Like, it's worth me being in a crack house, which is crazy dangerous, mm -hmm. so that I feel emotionally the way I want to feel. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense then. Yeah, but you're also with a, presuming you're with a group of people. Well, well, a group of strangers. Yeah, a group of strangers. Yes, the most desperate. Yeah, yeah. That must have made you feel. No, I was so judgmental of all of them. I was like, oh. oh, look at all these fucking addicts. All these crackheads are gross. I'm just here recreationally. <laughs> yeah. I'm not like that. I'm just, of course. I'm, I'm, just, yeah. I'm dipping in. I'm out. Yeah, yeah. it's all in group, out group. Yeah. I wasn't to the place where I could accept. I'm them too. Yeah. But it proves that you can have everything you think you want. Yes. And actually need something very different. Yeah. And it's counter to the story we we're born into. Yeah. Wait, I want to say something about privilege going back and turning the tables back on you. Mm -hmm. Now you're the patient. Yeah, buckle up. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Do I have to pay for this session or not? No, it's for, it's <laughs> no, on no, us. No, no, no. Okay. It, well, now it was reciprocal. I just had one. Exactly, one. exactly. Okay, cool. Okay. I'm going to say this because I don't think you can or people will maybe attack you for it, but it's really true. When you talk about going to the Commonwealth and you grew up like that and you had to empathize with all these people who are presumably in like much quote worse situations mm -hmm. than you and and they were they were worse situations but you were in a horrible situation too and had to put on a smile and walk around and be the person comforting but in some ways those people had more freedom than you did and I think that is a hard thing to reconcile like oh I'm in a cage or maybe you didn't know that yet mm -hmm. or but i'm supposed to be the smiley one and i'm supposed to be the one comforting yeah it's the, it's the, it's the job right uh yeah. grin, grin and bear it get on with it what was it in my early 20s i was a case of like i just i don't want this job yeah. i don't want to be here i don't want to be doing this look what it did to my mum. how am i ever gonna you know settle down i have a wife and a family when i know that it's gonna happen again yeah. because i know i've seen behind the curtain I've seen the business model. I know how this operation runs and how it works. Yeah. I don't want to be part of this. And then once I started doing therapy, suddenly it was like the bubble was burst. Yeah. I plucked my head out of the sand, gave a good shake off. And I was like, okay, you're in this position of privilege. Stop complaining or stop thinking as though you want something different. Make this different. Mm. Because you can't get out. Yeah. Mm. So how are you going to do this differently? How are you going to make your mom proud? How are you going to use this platform to really affect change and be able to give people that confidence to be able to change their own lives. It was interesting because well, now what I, looking back, and of course at the time it was the lack of awareness, but there was just the glimmer of awareness. Now looking back at it, I realized that helping other people helped me. Yeah. And when I created the Invictus Games, for instance, for wounded servicemen and women from what now, 20 different countries, when I started it was like, I'm just gonna create this platform because I know that sport rehabilitates people, both physically and emotionally and mentally. But once I started doing it, once I started to see the progress and the impact, I suddenly was like, wow, healing other people heals me. And I think that's where the, the sort of the compassion piece comes in for all of us, which way, is once yeah. you've suffered, you don't want anybody else to suffer. And it's an esteemable act. It's something yeah. you can actually be proud of yourself I for. A human, that's what we're supposed to do. Yes. Right? Compassion. There's an element of selfishness there. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. At all. I think if you helping other people gets you the fix that you want or that you need, 
happy days. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. that be a different world if we're like, you know what? I wake up this morning, I feel really shit. What am I going to do? I'm going to go and help my neighbor. Yeah. And I'm going to come back and then put my feet up and have a really good day. Yeah. It's like, part of AA. It's really it's quite like simple. Built in. Yeah. It's like the it's, cornerstone of AA is like really. service and acknowledging it's a very selfish endeavor. Yeah. And that's okay. There's a lot of ways to be selfish, and some of them are quite productive. And but helpful. I think some people think that you can only really have that element of compassion for friends or for, for people that you see on a day to day basis. But the reality is, service is universal. Yeah, yeah. Right? So wherever you go, you're going to find something that you can connect with somebody else okay. with. And it's always quite surprising. You were born in a palace, you're a prince. Someone could have been of service to you. Like, yeah. it doesn't have to be someone who is got a cup in their hand asking for change. Like everyone needs a hand, everyone needs yeah. an ear. I feel way more connection to those free people that you yeah. talk about, emotionally free people and I guess systemic free people. I feel way more connection to people that I met and work with in parts of Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, or whatever it is. Yeah. And I'm fortunate like that because the privilege does give you blinkers. Yeah. Mine were never particularly on straight. Yeah. I've always felt different. Why do you oh, think? Oh, God, yeah. there's, well, I got a whole... I might just open up a can of worms. No, no, I was <laughs> oh, gearing, here I, we go. I was already laying out for you when I was trying to empathize with your life today in researching you. First of all, I need to know, what was the moment for you that led to therapy? Like, what was your moment at the bar? It was a conversation that I had with my now wife. Okay. And she saw it. She saw it straight away. She could tell that I was hurting and that some of the stuff that was out of my control was making me really angry. Uh -huh. um, and it would make my blood boil. Well, you're a redhead, so I know I mean, you've got exactly. a hell of a temper. <laughs> you have that yeah. fire. No, it's not a temper. It's the fire. Uh -huh. yeah. I've never screamed. I've never shouted. I've never, like, for me, the best way of letting out any aggression is through boxing. Uh huh. Mm. But for me, prior to meeting Megan, it was very much a case of certainly connected to the media, that anger and frustration of this is so unjust. Not, by the way, not just about me, but about all this stuff that yeah, I'm yeah. seeing. The level of powerlessness you must feel. Helplessness. Yeah. That's my biggest sort of Achilles heel. The three major times that I felt completely helpless. One, when I was a kid in the back of the car with my mum being chased by paparazzi. Two was in Afghanistan in an Apache helicopter. And then the third one was with my wife. And those are the moments in my life where, yeah, feeling helpless hurts. It really hurts. Yeah. And that's when you think to yourself, shit, like, I got the privilege, I've got the platform, I've got the influence, and even I can't fix this. Yeah. I can't change this. And when you start getting in your head about it, that's when it starts sort of taking a toll. Well, you probably get self-critical as well, like, I would imagine. Massively self-critical. Yeah, if it were me, it'd be like, what the fuck? I have all the weapons, and here I am still can't alter the course of this at all. Yeah, I mean, the good thing is the course is being altered now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, look, everything is supply and demand. And in today's world, the way that hate has become so profitable, the system is set up so that whether you're for it or against it, you're still contributing to it. And I think it's really hard for people to understand, which is like, you see something hateful about someone or something, you then end up sharing it, saying, oh, look what they've done now. Look what, the, look what so and so said. But by sharing it, you're fueling the fire. So the yeah, best yeah. thing to do is to be able to be aware enough to go, I reject this. I'm going to push this out of my life. I'm not going to share it with somebody else. Why the hell would I share something that I hate with somebody else? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. share the good stuff. Yeah. And then collectively we can flip the whole, yeah. the whole thing. And then suddenly compassion, love, and empathy becomes the driving force rather than hate. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little bit, a little bit, a little bit deep there. Yeah, and I we enjoyed like it. it. I'm yeah. three quarters erect right now. Oh, God. But luckily my legs are clawed. This is crossed. part of his trauma. He can't go five minutes without making Being a sexual a reference. Okay, um... <laughs> I'm so glad you're here to keep us safe. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Armchair Expert, if you dare. We are supported by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. Monica, 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 what did you get into last night? I had closed out my weekend with a crunchy curried chickpea bowl. A bowl? Yes, it had raisins and um, a pickled cabbage. It was delicious and it felt healthy and hearty. Well, as you'd expect, I went a little more hearty than you. I went with a Monterey Jack unfried chicken, mm. buttery green beans, potato wedges, and sriracha mayo. Yum. <laughs> 
delicious. HelloFresh offers 25 plus recipes to choose from each week from vegetarian meals to craft burgers and extra special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy with all recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. Go to HelloFresh.com slash DAX12 and use code DAX12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash DAX12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. We are supported by McDonald's. <gasps> Yummy. McDonald's. Mickey D's. Listen, they've got an incredible offer right now, Monica. What is it? That I've, I've taken them up on. Buy one of your favorite items and get another for just a dollar. That is an incredible offer. And I have something to admit to you. What? As you know, I'm leaving for Las Vegas here in a second. I'm yeah. going to drive there. Yep. And I'm going to stop in Barstow, and I'm going to get two Big Macs. One of them will be for a dollar, and I'm going to get extra sauce and extra cheese, and I'm going to just smile ear to ear on my drive. Great plan. Thank you so much. You and I have had a lot of good times over at we McDonald's. We sure have. What's one of your favorite memories, Monica, of McDonald's? I mean, I guess Christmas Eve Eve is Aww. like takes the cake. That's our new tradition. I just got scared because next Christmas, what if I'm with my family? You can't be. Okay, I can't be because we right. got to go to McDonald's. Or we'll have to get on Zoom and eat okay. at McDonald's together. Okay. I promise to do that. Okay. There's a meal for every moment at McDonald's when you buy one of your faves like the Big Mac Quarter Pounder with Cheese, 10-piece Chicken McNuggets, or filet of fish and get another for just a dollar. Here's to our favorite memories with McDonald's and many more to come, especially now that we can buy one item and get another for just a dollar for a limited time at participating McDonald's. Every, I don't know, I shouldn't say every, every teenager I've ever met and myself included feels different and you feel like everyone else is getting it and you're not and you're on the outside even if you're like Seemingly accepted by the whole group. I think it's very normal to feel different, but then in your case, it's so compounded. You're in the tiniest in-group of all time. Yeah. Like, there's the whole country, <laughs> and then there's you guys, and you're standing in one direction, and they're standing in the other direction looking at you. The whole world. The, yeah, the whole world. I was liking it to Truman Show. Have you yeah, seen that movie? Yep. It's a mix between uh, the you, Truman Show and being in a zoo. Yes. Well, that's funny you'd say that because a couple of the snaps I've had in public, regrettably, I've said that. You're not at the fucking zoo and I'm not a bear. I'm not, I'm not the attraction. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, you were kind of cast into a movie without being asked, which is kind of a wild, wild thought. I don't know that anyone could actually Understand comprehend. That. Yeah, yeah Truman Show would have to be the closest thing. I think the, the biggest issue for me was that being born into it, you inherit the risk. You inherit the risk that comes with it. You inherit every element of it without choice. Mm -hmm. And because of the way that the UK media are, they feel an ownership over you. Mm -hmm. Literally, like a full-on ownership. And then they give the impression to some of their, well, most of their readers, that that is the case. But I think it's a really dangerous place to be if you don't have a choice. But then, of course, then people quite rightly will turn around and go, so what if you didn't have a choice? It was privilege. Yeah, no, I, I reject this because this was an argument made to Kristen and I. We had this whole campaign for paparazzi and magazines here in the U.S. to not show kids anymore. It's called No Kids Policy, and most of the magazines adopted it. There's a couple of shitty places that still do that, TMZ and fucking World Mail or whatever the shitty thing Daily you have in Mail. London. Yeah, Daily and, Mail. And page 6 of the New York Post. They took pictures of my son being picked up from school on his first day. Yeah, Thanks so they that. didn't, but the majority did. So but, but when we first had our daughter Lincoln, the paparazzi lived across the street from our house yeah. endlessly, right? Since then, it stopped yeah. and it's been great. But I reject, you chose this. Yes, Dax chose this yeah. and Kristen chose this, but my fucking children didn't choose shit. They were just born into this house. And I fucking reject that that goes with the territory for children. Yeah, well, first of all, the people that are taking photographs and making money off of your life and your misery mm -hmm. are probably the same people that really enjoy your movies. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, exactly. I'm a big, big, big fan of Employee of the Month. By the way. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, but I guess my point is the way that I look at it, especially now living here one hour outside LA, like it's a feeding frenzy here. Yeah. Right? We spent the first three and a half months living at Tyler Perry's house. Okay. Right. He let us stay. <laughs> and the helicopters, Squatting the helicopters, the drones, the paparazzi wow. cuts cutting the fence. Like it was madness. Yeah. 
And people out there, their response was, well, what do you expect if you live in L.A.? It's like, okay, well, first of all, we didn't mean to live in L.A. This right. is like a staging area before we try and find a yeah. house. Yeah. And secondly, how sad that if you live in L.A. and you are a well-known figure... You should not you be just, able you to, just have to accept, accept it. it. And yeah. the, and the first, you have to live indoors. Yeah, and the first lot of security we had said, I said, well, where's the safest place? He said, inside. <laughs> and I said, sorry, so just because I'm a well-known person... You can't go outside anymore. You can't go outside anymore. That's what you wanted, Harry. <laughs> yeah. You wanted to not go outside. You've always but it, wanted that. But it's, but it's really, really sad. And of yes. course, their argument is from the paparazzi and everybody else is like, oh, if you're in the public space, then it's absolutely yeah. fine for us to do it. It's like, yes. so what is our human right as an individual and as a family? You're saying that if the moment we step foot out of our house, that it's open season and free game. Yeah. What, because of public interest? There's exactly. no public interest in you taking your kids for a walk down the beach. Right. Nothing. Yes. And of there's course, there's not news. No, there's not news. Yeah, yeah. This is my issue with it. It's like news should stay as news. What has happened in today's world is that news has been hijacked and used to commercially benefit a small group of people. So it's this sort of rabid feeding frenzy. And going back to the kids' point, it's absolutely true. Like these kids don't get a choice, they don't get a say in it. Mm -mm. And if it becomes any worse, then what you're basically accepting is, okay, fine, so anyone with a talent. Any, yeah. Any, yeah. Let's, any, let's criminalize. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's punish let's, everyone. Let's punish people who've got a talent and have driven and have, and have literally <laughs> worked their asses off yeah. to get to a point where, yes, they're making money, and yes, their fans are contributing to that. Yeah, yeah. But they're bringing entertainment and value to society, whether it's through movies, whether it's through music or whatever. Yeah. So if you continue to chase them and their kids, you're probably going to not just stop them from wanting to go to work. You're certainly going to put their kids off ever wanting to. So it's it kind of is self-defeating. It's a weird one. So Strange. having moved, it got better there? Yeah, way better. Oh, good, good. But just, what, two days ago, Orlando Bloom sent me a message because he's down the road and we sort of keep in contact because of the paparazzi. Yeah. He sent me a photograph, which his security got, of this long-haired guy with a beanie on with his earpods in with his massive camera lying in the back of his 4x4 truck, blacked out windows, a woman driving, who she likes the sort of the peace sign where she's sitting there as a distraction, oh, and he's geez. laid down in the back of this truck taking photographs of them out with their kid yeah, uh, and uh, whoever else is in that area. Yeah. How is that normal? How is well, that acceptable? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, when we took this on, I didn't try for a second to say legally this shouldn't be allowed. Because I know our First Amendment is such that it is going to protect the press, as in some ways it should. It's the fourth estate. That wasn't my argument. My argument was, you know what else isn't illegal? Shitting on your dining room table. Mm -hmm. It's not illegal. You mm -hmm. could totally do it. You wouldn't do it because you're not a monster. <laughs> so it's legal to run into the cinema and shout fire. Yes, that's yeah. true. But there's other reasons you wouldn't do something other than the law. You know what I'm saying? I would implore people to not evaluate what, well, anything that's legal I should be doing. So shitting on my uh, kitchen table, I should do because there's no law against it. That's not how one's brain should work. Well, that is, again, I don't want to start sort of going down the first amendment route because that's a huge subject and one of which I don't understand because I've only been here for a short period of time. But you can find a loophole in anything mm -hmm. and you can capitalize or exploit what's not said rather than uphold what is said. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, sure, We sure. can do that with anything yes. we want. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. there's a commercial incentive, yeah. then great. Or if there's an you know, ideology or you want to spread hate, laws were created to protect people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah. Well, increasingly companies as well. well uh, Citizens uh, United. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> but, you know, to put this one to bed for me, you guys yeah. can carry on talking about it, but I believe we live in an age now where you've got certain elements of the media redefining to us what privacy means. Well, yeah, there's a massive conflict of interest. Yeah, and then you've got social media platforms trying to redefine what free speech means. Yeah, why? I wonder why you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. and again, so this has been happening for 15 years now, and we're living in this world where we've almost like well, the laws have been completely flipped by the very people that need them flipped, so that they can make more money and they can capitalize off our pain, grief, and this sort of general self-destructive mode that's happening at the moment. So. There's conflict of interest is like the major piece here. And yeah. Yeah. You know, as you say, like you want to show the kitchen table, like just <laughs> well, because there's not a law. Yeah. Passed. Good, well, good for you. <laughs> you're you're on, within guys. the bounds of the law. Congratulations. Exactly. Like powered yeah. back to the people. Yeah. Like and you go to sleep at night and you're like, well, I didn't break the law. You feel good. But Dax, it does come back to supply and demand. Yeah. Right. Totally. If we collectively became better at not clicking on and not uh -huh. spreading or sharing the things that we know are putting other people through hell. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's no market for it. I totally but the agree. The more depressed and the harder life becomes, 
we end up surrendering to the information parallel with our own feelings. Yeah. That's the information that we end up sort of being drawn into. Yeah, and the, and the last stop is the pound and the dollar. I mean, it's literally that simple, to yeah. your point. If no one can profit on any of this stuff, it vanishes. Okay. That was fun. Just yeah, 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 yeah. I got so much I want to say about the First Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, you're, I, I still don't understand it, but it is bonkers. It is bonkers. So, having been born in The Truman Show, I'm curious... Did you watch television and did movies? Did I make it to the edge? Did I find the <laughs> yeah, forest? Did yeah. I break the far escape? <laughs> did you sail your little boat to the edge? Well, you did. Did you watch TV and movies as a kid with a kind of peculiar interest in non-royal life? Because how else would you observe it? I was thinking like you've probably never went to the grocery store with your mom or stood in line with her as she renewed her license or all these weird little mundane things. Did you like have an interest in those weird things? And no, I definitely, went, I definitely went shopping with her. Oh, you did? A few times, yeah. Oh, okay. But only a handful of times because every time we came out... I was going to say, how got, could you? We got pounced on. I mean, there was very, yeah. very rarely a day that went by without at least one paparazzi jumping out from behind a car or something. Right. But also, at the same time, the beauty of it is, like, the first time that Megan and I met up for her to come and stay with me, we met up in a supermarket in London. Pretending that we didn't know each other, so we texting each other from the other side of the <laughs> other side. The of the cloak and dagger. And there were people looking at me, giving me all these weird looks, and coming up and saying hi, whatever. And I was there texting, saying, "Is this the right one?" She goes, "No, you want parchment paper." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> where, where's the parchment paper?" <laughs> um, so it was nice. You had baseball cap on, like looking down at the floor. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many times you've done that when you're yeah. walking along the street, trying to stay incognito. It's like, whoa, signpost. Oh, someone's dog. Oh, hi. <laughs> it's amazing what you see, how much chewing gum you see, and, sure. and how many people's shoes you see. It's a <laughs> <laughs> so living here now, I can actually like lift my head and actually f I feel different. My shoulders have dropped, so's hers. I can't and imagine. And you can walk around feeling a little bit more free. I get to take Archie on the back of my bicycle. Now I've said that, they're probably going to be. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, would, yeah. I'd never, I would never have the chance to do that. Yeah. Uh, a thousand percent. But did you watch movies and TV with a peculiar interest or you don't even recall? No, I just watch royal movies. <laughs> just to really make sure that my echo chamber was was Complete. absolutely <laughs> solid. Impenetrable. Uh -huh. Impenetrable. This is this Air is my type. life. This is what I'm gonna learn about. This is everything. This is all I ever wanted. No, of course to be. you watched it, but did you watch it with like the reverse care? So here here's what I'm no, I watched, here's what I'm saying. Watched Disney. Okay. Yeah. Here's what I was thinking. I was talking to my wife this morning. I was like, what kind of curiosities do you have? And we got talking, and I was like, oh my God, you know what's really bizarre about his life is that you learn all these fairy tales when you're growing up, like, oh, and the prince gets to the princess and all that. I think it'd be so bizarre for you to be told this story and that the ultimate prize would be to become royalty. And you'd be sitting there just feeling like a normal person, like, well, this doesn't feel all that euphoric. Like, I feel like that would be a real cognitive dissonance moment. Like, I do think that kind of old way of thinking of the prince, the princess, like, all these little girls reading these wonderful fairy tales going, yeah. oh, well, I want to be as a princess. And I'm thinking... Uh, <laughs> it's not so rad. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, and I forgot. I'm not going to even... I'm not going to get it right, so I'm not going to say it. But my wife had the most amazing sort of explanation to that, which is almost like something... Well, I'm not going to get it right, but it's, you don't need to be a princess. You can create the life that will be better than any princess or any... It's yeah. something yeah, 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 yeah. and that's coming from her own lived experience. Yeah. Right, she right? did it. We got together and she's like, wow, this is very different to what my friends at the beginning said. That, like, it would what? Be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I know, I think a lot of people feel like, well, everyone knows what they're getting into when they marry a prince. But how. Well, you, even I, no I'm like, what know. could she have expected that she was going to go drive around town and everything would be normal. Like I had that thought of like, she's in, super intelligent. She couldn't have thought. Now, mind you, I learned she didn't leave the house for five months. That's like solitary confinement. So I recognize it's even way worse than you can imagine. But I did think like, oh, you couldn't have thought, oh, I'm going to just travel freely. No, now. no, of course not. And she never thought that. I think yeah. she said before she expected it to be fair. Yeah, right? which I think exactly. anybody does. It's like, yeah, OK, I'm a public role model or mm -hmm. I'm a public figure or I'm a celebrity, whatever it is you expect a certain element of interest in your life. Sure. But at the same time, you still expect to be able to have a private life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed to this idea of every time you step foot outside, you get chased. Yeah. And even when you stay inside, because of the way that social media is now, you're everywhere yeah. while you're nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. actually, and also, by the way, if it's not true, then that is unfair. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, a thousand and percent. Especially when yeah. you can't defend yourself. So, yeah. yes, I think when yeah. you marry into it, especially when it's one of Princess Diana's sons, uh-huh. yeah. there is a certain amount of, okay, what am I actually letting myself in for? But very few people actually know, apart from the Brits, how toxic yeah. that element of the of the UK press is. Well, and then the one thing that was undeniable, because, of course, I watched a good deal of the Oprah thing. My favorite part is you playing with chickens while they're talking, <laughs> honestly. You know, they've, I all was got, like... they've all got feathers now. Oh, they do? Yeah. So oh, they, we, they're all rehabilitated from, oh, uh, from fa- factory farm. What do you call it in America? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Factory, factory farm yeah. or what's the other word? I can't remember. Anyway, they all, they all came butt naked uh, with, uh-huh. uh, with a couple of feathers out their chin and uh-huh. maybe one out their stomach. And, and now after, what, three or four weeks... Well, they, they started laying eggs immediately, which made us quite proud as, as parents. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, oh my God, we were told you weren't going to lay for ages and you've already laid eggs. This is they so feel good. so uh, safe. Yeah, and now they're running around fully feathered. Yeah, anyway, back to the chickens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh God, that would be me in this interview. Like, my wife would be talking to Oprah and be like, oh, there's a lot of talking. I think yeah. I'm going to play with these Where chickens. The chickens need attention. Where the chickens need a distraction. Yeah. Where the chickens? Find me the chickens. Uh, but you said the glasses were never on exactly right. The blinders, you guys blinders. call them. I call them blinkers. I think you guys call them blinders. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. got confusing when you said blinkers. I was thought you were, that was what you were a that's moped. Your, that's your confusing face. That, that's what just derailed me. I was like, wait, you had <laughs> fucking blinkers installed? <laughs> blinders, 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 blinders. They weren't exactly installed correctly on you. And why do you th- do you think that's because of your mom? Yeah, definitely. The Im- massive, immense impact that she had on us in the short time that she was around yeah. was huge because all she wanted to do was make sure that we had as normal life as possible. But it was interesting, so going back to the whole sort of traveling around the Commonwealth, I thought I knew, right? Having been able to travel that much and meet so many and so such a diverse group of people, I thought I understood life. Yeah. Especially, bear in mind, most of the countries that I was going to were, and most of the communities I was going to were people of color. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then I was really shocked once I started doing therapy and that bubble was burst and I started doing my own work, really like a lot of work. Yeah. I started to uncover and understand more about unconscious bias. And I was like, wow, I thought since I screwed up when I was younger and then did the work, I thought I then knew but I didn't. Yeah. And I still don't fully know. No. Yeah. It's a constant, like, constant working progress. Totally. Like, and every single one of us has it. Yes. Oh, a thousand percent. I've been saying that a lot on here is like, there needs to be another word that doesn't relegate you to a member of the clan to be able to say, I'm unraveling it. There's shit I just, I literally couldn't see, was unaware of, didn't yeah. recognize. And that's not over. I know there's uh, there going to be other revelations for me where I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah and, and that. And you're right. And a lot of people do view it as like, you're either racist or you're not. Yeah, binary. And it's like the middle ground, not even the middle ground, the rest of it is where we all are. Yes. And it's not just black and white. Yeah, right? Right, Everyone yeah. has biases yeah. of all sorts. Yeah. Yes. But I think it's a really important point, especially now after everything's happened in the last year and a half. Like, the world is changing. The younger generation are driving it, and you've got, a, like, a multiracial, cultural sort of movement happening, which has never happened before. But unconscious bias is, the way that I understand it, is, again, it's not something that's wrong with you, right? And you don't have to be defensive about it. Yeah. That's the thing. No one's blaming you. Mm-hmm. But the moment that you acknowledge that you do have unconscious bias, what are you going to do about it? Exactly. Because if you choose to do nothing... Now we got a problem. Then you're continuing to fuel the problem, which means that actually you're then heading towards racism. Yes. Whereas unconscious Mm. bias is actually something that is inherent, unfortunately, in in every single one of us, but that it is possible to educate yourself to be more aware of the problems and therefore be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. As we say, it's the water you grow up in. You can't see the water. The water you're swimming in. The water you're swimming in. Just keep swimming. Okay. (laughs) When I imagine your life, I spent a lot of time was, pretending I was, I was, I was with say, you today. How often does that happen? <laughs> a lot of that, now that I've now that I've spent time with you, please remove me from your head, <laughs> no, from your no, torso, no. wanting it's, photographs. It's only gotten oh, worse. Yeah, Eric. now he so really wants. Here's it. what I here here's what if I were you, I feel like I would have loved the military. Did you love going into the military? Well, you would have act- been, been kicked out pretty quick. Oh, yeah. I have the <laughs> biggest so uh, authority too. complex. <laughs> yeah, I would not be a good candidate for the military, but. I imagine having grown up in the fishbowl that you were in and the in and out group being like just 10 of us in the rest of the world. Now you enter this brotherhood, this fraternity, and now you're in an in group that's huge. Now you're living in a fucking, I don't, there's no royal treatment in the military, right? You're in the same shitty barracks and you're fucking doing all the stuff you have to do. I have to imagine you, did you love that? 
I loved it. I love wearing the same uniform as everybody else. Yeah. I love being treated the same. Yeah. I love the expectation of if you want to get that job or you want that promotion or you want to finish this race, it's all on you. Yeah, it's a meritocracy. There's no special treatment. You're not going to get any help. Yeah. If anything, you're probably going to get treated the opposite because everyone thinks that you've had an easy life and everyone's always helped you get to where you are. Yes. And then suddenly, like, well, school, I hated exams. Yeah. And I promised myself I'd never do exams again. Then I joined the army, of which is full of exams. <laughs> and I still promised myself I'm never going to do this. And then I ended up flying Apache helicopters, of which is full of exams. Yeah. I'm just like, what am I doing to myself? Wait, wait hold on. You are, you, you are a pilot? I was. Get the fuck out. No you flew an Apache. Yeah. Now I definitely need your torso shot. Way more than <laughs> well, I needed it before. What we should do is we should go dune buggy together. Yes. You take me for a helicopter ride. I'll take you in the dune car. Yeah. And oh, my God. I'll put oh. a 30 millimeter cannon on the top. Okay, perfect, perfect. And it's, then, it, yeah, we can have great fun. It's cro it's a uh, chrome only tubing, 4130. It could definitely support the weight. <laughs> <laughs> but you have an RAF flag on the side of it, which is shocking. That's going to be an issue for you. I'm going to paint over it. I, it's really from Quadrophenia, to be honest. It's a, it's a reference to the who more than the RAF. But Okay, well, the army in the I, UK I, call, I, the, call the RAF crabs. Oh, they do? Yeah, All right, something, crabs. something about the tide, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, two things I thought. Wow, you must have really loved that experience. And what a great way to teleport into a different life that you had been kind of denied. A normal life. Yes. Right? As yes. normal as I was. Which was probably guess. so fucking exotic to you. I'm not entirely sure whether exotic would be the word, <laughs> bearing in mind some of the accommodation I had to live in and some but of But exotic in the sense that it was so a, a rare. It was rare in... Uh, uh, I think it was... The, it certainly made me. Yeah. Without question. This, is, this goes back to the trauma piece. What I didn't realize was during those years, I was still functioning and being driven by adrenaline. Yeah. So actually, I was one of the best candidates for that role at that time. For sure, because you're good at living in chaos. Good at living in chaos. I could manage four radios uh, at one time. If there was anything painful, whether it was my body or whatever, I would just push through it. And so, yeah, that expectation is that that, oh, he's going to be tailing behind everybody else because he's a prince. Yeah. And the a... moment that I was towards the front, and by the way, the rule was, don't be at the back, don't be in the front, be in the middle. Because you don't want to draw attention. You do not want to be the first across the line because then the next week, if you're hungover, tired, mm. you're just pissed off, and you're not at the front, you're then the directing staff are like, you're underperforming. It's yeah. like, no, the last week was a good week. <laughs> <laughs> don't pick on me, come I on, had, please. I had had electrolytes for breakfast. Or worse, they turn around and say, right, because last week you're at the front, this week, you got to carry his Bergen. I'm like, what, 30 extra pounds? Uh, no. <laughs> it was. It was the most normalizing experience or job that I could have ever hoped for. And then going to Afghanistan twice. Yeah. And I'm super lucky in that I got to go twice, 07 and 09, mm -hmm. for a week so I could leave. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, yeah, it is a very, very unique thing to observe. And mm -hmm. I'm so grateful I got to see that in yeah. real life because it is one of the most unique experiences a human yeah. can go through. You see people from all walks of life coming together, wearing the same uniform for the same goal, yeah. the same mission. Yeah, and you want to talk about a Petri dish of trauma. In AA, when one of us dies, we have a different relationship with it than other people on the outside. Okay. Like some of our famous members have died. And for us, it sounds callous. We're like, yeah, that's what happens. Like, that's the expectation. If you like, take it too far. Yeah, and if you don't do this thing, yes, that's the outcome. This isn't a surprise. It's observed all the time. That's one of the main key lessons within AA, presumably, which is, guys, if you're not here and you're not taking this seriously, the, the end goal, not the end goal, for some people, maybe it is, well, the, the end result, the yeah. consequence is death. Don't be surprised by that. And so, likewise, when I was over there, some guys got killed while I was there at a base. Some came back wounded. We went into the hospital to cheer them up. And I watched and I observed the people and how they were dealing with it. And mm -hmm. what I immediately recognized was they've dealt with this a lot. Yeah. And similar to when things get violent, for me, I'm calm. I've been there. I've been there dozens of times mm -hmm. from my childhood. And so what you're recognizing is like, oh, everyone's dealing with trauma there. Everyone mm -hmm. has a method of dealing with trauma yeah. and i couldn't not see it because again i was already sober and stuff so i was just pretty fascinated with the culture and what people become used to look first of all everyone has a story right and but when you are on the mission when you're out on operations there is a certain mentality of okay i'm here for five months or six months or seven months or in a lot of the u.s troops maybe 12 months or 14 months which still is mind-boggling to come back 
and meet your kid that might be eight or nine months old has never seen never seen you before but i think there's a mindset that while i'm here doing this job i'm not going to think about the fact that one of my friends just got blown up and then now sort of kazavak back to the uk it's not an option it's not an option yeah. you can't yeah but then what happens at the end yes right exactly. because then you go back into society you go back to normal life you find yourself walking down the aisle in a supermarket yeah. by yourself with an empty shopping basket going um why was i here yeah what am i getting i wouldn't say you become addicted to the noise but there was a study that was done in the uk with some of the special forces guys where they were strapped up with the heart monitors and they were showing more stress walking back home with their kids running around and stepping on toys and stuff oh, wow. than they were kicking the door down and going in and doing the dirty on the bad guys. And you can think about like when you've got the uniform on, when you're with your mates, when you're with the guys, yeah. you know what the task at hand is. It might not be nice, it might not be pleasant, but it's something you've got to do. Yes. Right? And you have the illusion of control. You, you have some power over your outcome. But with the kids, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm vulnerable here. Vulnerable is completely out of my control. I haven't yeah. been trained to do this. Yes, exactly. And when I'm wearing my uniform, I've got this cloak that I put on, an identity which basically gives me this mental strength to be able to adapt and overcome anything yeah. and be the very best that I am in that moment because it is life or death. Yeah. But the stress is there. It's just going to get displaced. Well, like it is building in your body. And then when you're at home and your kids are stepping on toys, that's when you see it. I was just going to say, and I do not want it to sound like I'm comparing myself to a soldier because I am not. I didn't go through anything, but I had to stand on the flight line and salute while they played the bagpipes and they brought back two guys that were dead and then go into, like I said, the surgery room and entertain these guys. And during that whole process, I was just invigorated. Like it was a very surreal, unique experience. And then when I got back, I was telling my mother the story on the phone, like yeah. 12 days after, and I'm back in LA. And as I'm trying to tell her about the bagpipes, I start crying. Mm. And I was like, oh. oh, I didn't think that affected me. Of course it does. I watched two dead people come back and that's so sad and they were young and I just, at the time, I didn't acknowledge it. Yeah, but also you didn't know them, right? Right, so you, yeah, yeah. So you're comparing your own experience to his or her mates, uh -huh. right? Yeah, Their comrades. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is not my moment, right? Exactly. They've died, they're a team, they're together, I'm an observer. But the reality is, well, certainly what I've learned over the years is people feel different stages and different effects from trauma throughout their lives to the point of where you can actually be driving down the highway Notice I didn't say in motorway. I really am becoming American. <laughs> Drive down the highway and you see a road traffic accident on the other side. Like that stuff can affect you, right? Yeah, yeah. Stuff you see on social media can affect you. Yeah. Stuff within your own family, within your own household can affect you. We just brush this stuff off every single day. And someone said to me very recently, from the moment that you're born into today's world, life is trauma. Sure. So yeah, the sooner yeah. that we actually acknowledge that, but, but so it's like that cape. It's knowing when to take that cape off and being able to not so much vent but being able to release whatever it is that you've seen or experienced or just let as yourself soon, experience it exactly yeah. but as soon as possible the sooner that you can do it the yeah. better because otherwise it manifests itself and as we always know the body holds the score so you may think that mentally i'm fine yeah but your body's holding on to that and sooner or later the bill it, comes due and if you're not aware of it then you'll keep suppressing it and it will come out of you as forms of projection against the people that you love yeah so far better to process it and continue to put in the work and continue to be aware of what your body's telling your head and your head's telling your body to be able to find that equilibrium stay tuned for more armchair expert if you dare we are supported by master class with Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to write for television from Shonda Rhimes. Best in the biz. You can improve your effective and authentic communication skills from Robin Roberts. Or learn the science of better sleep from Matthew Walker. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I did the science for better sleep by Walker mm -hmm. and it's exceptional because I, you know, I value sleep more than any other thing. You it's do. The cornerstone to my f health and fitness. Yeah. 
I really believe in it. Now listen, you could learn how to do anything from write a book to a screenplay or just a letter. Learn how to communicate with your boss, your family, or how to make a dinner worthy of a Michelin star. Or heck, just how to make some really good scrambled eggs. Cinema quality classes that give you unparalleled access to a renowned master. They really do produce them beautifully. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass. And as an armchair, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash DAX. That's masterclass.com slash Dax for 15% off masterclass. We are supported by Credit Karma. Credit Karma has always been there to help you make better financial decisions, and now they want to help you even more. With a Credit Karma money spend account, you can be rewarded for good money habits. Who doesn't want instant gratification? If you're looking for satisfaction, there's no need to wait. With Credit Karma money, you could win cash reimbursements for debit purchases. Credit Karma money is a brand new checking account where you can win cash reimbursements for making purchases. When you use your Credit Karma money debit card, you can win daily instant karma purchase reimbursements on items up to $5,000. Just pay with your debit card, and if you win, you'll be notified on the spot, and your Instant Karma cash will be added back to your spend account. Open your FDIC-insured spend account for free. There's no minimum balance requirements, no overdraft fees, and free withdrawals from a network of over 50,000 ATMs. Credit Karma money. Progress starts here. Go to creditkarma.com slash win money to sign up for free and start winning instant karma. That's creditkarma.com slash win money. Right now, visit creditkarma.com slash win money to open your free account and start winning instant karma. Instant karma is sponsored by Credit Karma. No purchase necessary. Exclusions and terms apply. See rules. Banking services provided by MVB Bank Incorporated. Member FDIC. Maximum balance and transfer limits apply. For me, our mental health is as important, in fact, way more important than our physical health. Yeah, oh yeah. So if we're looking after our body and our body gets injured, what do we do when our mind gets injured? And if you've seen your mate get blown up in Afghanistan or something, that's going to trigger you. But then the last thing I'd say on this is, like, the Ministry of Defence back in the UK get a really hard time for the number. In fact, it was remarkably small in comparison to what the media said it was. But the guys that were coming back from operations that were suffering from mental health illnesses. post PTSD. Yeah, and, yeah. PTSI, I call it. Because for me, the disorder is even smaller number to the overall PTS group of people. Because... Most of them suffer from, most of us suffer from post-traumatic stress injury, mm -hmm. right? It's an injury. It's something that just You could like, heal from. You can heal from. Yeah, it. the language is important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just saying to someone, okay, you've, I'm diagnosing you with PTSD. You've got a disorder for the rest of your life. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing you, you can do about it. At best, you'll manage it. You yeah. won't heal it. Exactly. Whereas then yeah. you've got post-traumatic stress injuries. Like, well, that makes sense because I just saw my mate get blown up. Yeah. But the other piece to this is what we need to remember is the, a lot of the recruiting that we do in the UK comes from certain cities and certain homes where there's oh where there's childhood yeah. trauma. Yeah. So what we collectively have already got inside of us, the trigger of seeing something happen in Iraq, Afghanistan, can be the trigger. So everyone goes, oh, it's because they were on operations and because they saw their mate get blown up. It's like, no. It's that, a chicken or egg. That was the lid coming off of all the other unresolved grief, trauma, and pain that they've yeah. been suffering from for so many years. Which made them good at that job, too. Precisely. Yeah, yeah so I think some of the trick, of course, is like, I want all the shit I got out of that trauma. I want the spidey senses. I want to be calm under fire. I want, when all hell's breaking loose, I want to be the level-headed person. So I want to keep the, like, upside of it, and then I want to minimize the downside. So that's what I've been working on for years. <laughs> for the last five years, which is like, and it started in therapy of like i don't want to lose this thing because i think it's, i feel it's so connected to my mum. Uh -huh. little did i know it's adrenaline right mm. but then once i was like okay the fear of losing that whatever this special thing was inside of me that was helping me communicate with people mm. giving me this en extra energy despite the fact that after 45 minutes of meeting people i get back in the car and <laughs> feel as i've just been in a boxing ring doing <laughs> yeah. 12 rounds I'm yeah like, oh i got exhausted yeah once you find that balance of being able to switch it on and switch it off and being able to like channel all of that energy into the moment or the task at hand, then you're talking about more like a sort of like a consciousness, awareness, strength yeah. of mind, mental fitness piece. Yeah, and having choice. That's having the choice. ultimate goal. And prevention, right? Staying ahead yes. of what you know yeah. is going to come. 
for me, it's expectations. So taking a minute to go, okay, we're about to go to the airport. When I get to the airport, the TSA guy is going to make me do something that makes no sense. It'll be absolutely illogical, and I'm going to have no control over that, and that's going to happen. And then I'm going to get to the gate. I'm going to see a lot of people sneaking pictures of my children. That's coming. Yeah. Like when I can enter those situations having already thought through, like here's all the things coming, I'm so much better in those situations. You have to, though, because we've all got the monkey brain, right? Yeah. And it's the same as you get caught in rush hour. Every single day, yeah. you do the same thing, you I jump know. in the car, you know you're going to get caught <laughs> yeah, in traffic, it's ridiculous. but then you still lose your mind like, ah, oh, yes. I'm going to be late. I'll tell you what, <laughs> why not just write a list saying, these things are going to happen, yeah. and I'm just going to accept it and deal with it because it's out of my control. There's nothing that I can do about it. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for failure every single day. Yeah. yeah. Wait, can we talk about parenting real quick? Because... You were parented in such a specific way, not just by your dad, but by the whole family. And it's so specific that I wonder. And like you said, like you were told, oh, you are just something's wrong with you. You're crazy. I wonder, are you trying to parent in the opposite direction? Yeah. What you'll see in the Me You Can't See that comes out on the 21st of May is very much a case of, I verbalize it, which is, isn't life about breaking the cycle? Yeah. Right. There's no blame. Yeah. I don't think we should be pointing the finger or blaming anybody. But certainly when it comes to parenting, if I've experienced some form of pain or suffering because of the pain or suffering that perhaps my father or my parents had suffered, I'm going to make sure that I break that cycle so that I don't pass it on, basically. Yeah. There's a lot of genetic pain and suffering that gets passed on anyway. Yeah, and the we as parents, we should be doing the most that we can to try and say, you know what, that happened to me, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen to you. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to do because some of it's so just It's really hard your... to do, but for me it comes down to awareness. Like yeah. I never I never saw it, I never knew about it, and then suddenly I started to piece it all together and go, okay, so this is where he went to school. This is what happened. I know this bit about his life. I also know that's connected to his parents. Yeah. So that means that he's treating me the way that he was treated. Exactly. Which means how can I change that? for my own kids and well here I am I've now moved my whole family to the US well, that wasn't the plan do you know what I mean <laughs> exactly. but sometimes you've got to make decisions <laughs> and put your family first and put your mental health first and when I'm talking about mental health again on that spectrum piece like mental illness is at one end yeah and then total joy and happiness is at the other and no one's there by the way yeah, no, one's, no one's really there then, yeah. you know, certain days and certain weeks of course you can be there Tom Hanks but like, <laughs> no he has ups and downs he has ups but and life downs. is a roller coaster ride yes yeah. and the way that I view it now that gives me such peace of mind which is the bad stuff that happens what can you learn from it mm -hmm. if the universe is basically saying to you right I'm going to school you what yeah. can I take from each of those moments that's going to make me better prepared for the next time around and if you go into life like that, certainly for me, it helps so much. I just got so excited. Uh -huh. One of our big fascinations is the simulation. How could Harry not have thought this is a simulation? Because he, he would be yeah. going, oh, I was born a prince. What are the And odds? I'm the one person to leave. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is impossible. We're pretty sure we're in a simulation. Cause... Really? What do you mean in the moment I open that door? It's going to be like, great. Thank you so much. Okay, we don't need you anymore in this role. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> what, you mean life? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah we're, you we're, did your part. You're cut. Well, don't worry, we're, we're going to kill you off. And yeah, down the elevator shaft, you good with that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Ours is the least egocentric version of this because we believe we're in her father's simulation. So he came here from India. So we think he's somewhere and he bought this amazing story. He bought a package. <laughs> and we're it's all like, characters. He's going to move. Nice. And he's going to be very successful, and then his daughter is going to do so well. Okay, this question is for you. Okay. What are you doing? How long do we have left? Just Three so and a half hours. Five minutes. Yeah, five, five minutes. minutes. That's an hour and a half gone. Yeah. I know. You know what that means? time stop? What? That, that's called flow, the state of flow. We get in it in this attic. Well, the boring thing is you've got, what, two or three pages of questions <laughs> there. You've actually looked at it twice. I can memorize this stuff. Okay. And also, got, sometimes we don't... Have, yeah, he doesn't yeah, yeah. we go with the flow. Yeah. We follow the rhythm. Okay, this question's for Monica. Have you watched The Crown? Questions for Monica. Well, he's for asking her. you he, on... This, when I told you I don't know much about the royals, yeah. we've had 35 <laughs> arguments on this podcast because she loves The Crown, and she keeps trying to get me hooked into okay, it. And well, I'm like, why do you don't love the crown? get it. I love The Crown because... <laughs> I am fascinated by the fact that everyone involved is living a life that looks very privileged and they are tortured. They're all suffering so deeply. And like, I have so much compassion for everyone when I'm watching it. 
the show is so slow, quote, yeah. but there's so much emotional yeah. depth. And I didn't know. I didn't know about any of this stuff. I also, like, wasn't super knowledgeable. Sure. I just didn't know that everyone was so... And this is what I'm saying when I said, like, I think when everyone says, you should know what you're getting yourself into, there's no way to know that that life comes with such a sacrifice, mm -hmm. a huge sacrifice for a country. Like, mm -hmm. I can't wrap my head around that. Being born with the weight of the country on your yes, shoulders? Yes, like, it's hard enough to sacrifice for someone you care about, let alone, like, people you don't know, a whole country, and it's a just concept. being passed. A concept, exactly. Yeah. It's A mental construct. You only know what you know, right? So I think that there's a difference there between the, those of us in the family that have been born into it and those that have married into it. Coming yeah. from a relatively normal life, yeah. Yeah. coming into that is a real sh shock. Yeah. Huge shock. The you only know what you know is part of the fascination. It's like, we all only know what we know. We all are in our own fishbowls of, of some sort yeah. and are getting past information down that we just take. Yeah. We take unless you force yourself to come out of it and like you did, which yeah. is so, I, I have so much admiration because especially after watching that, even though I know it's a show, yeah. what you did truly seems impossible and takes so much strength. And I have tons of admiration for you doing that for yeah. your family and for and you. And if things go sideways with you and Megan, just. Uh, <laughs> kind of a house right over there. Yeah, we could, um, we could be neighbors. We go to the dunes all the time. Right. No, it's really amazing. It really is. That's sweet. I think. One of the points is like when you realize that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, at that point, I guess I have to thank the UK press at this point because it got so bad so quickly. It liberated you. Yeah. It was like forced you into a corner. The moment you have to acknowledge that fear and go, yeah. actually, I'm no longer scared of you. I'm no longer scared of doing or saying what you want me to do or say. You basically confronted an, uh, an abuser, which is like exactly. the most scary idea That's in the world. Exactly right. And I think it takes a very special personality to do it. I know you're saying you were kind of forced into it, but other people in your family are in this similar position. Well, I did wonder, do you think you could have done it if you were the oldest? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, that's probably too dodgy of a question to even ask you. So you've never seen it, I would imagine? Or have you seen it, The Crown? I managed to get away with... <laughs> Not answering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You should that's run okay, for you don't have James to Corden asked me the same question. I've seen elements of it. I'm sure everyone you talk to is going to ask you that, but... Yeah. It's a very good show. It's a good show. <laughs> no, it's, I hear it's very popular. <laughs> I'm trying to... Well, knowing I was going to ask you that on Monica's behalf, I was, again, trying to imagine, okay, so I was born in this thing, they make a movie, they make, you know, like a, seven seasons about my family. I would certainly be curious, and then also I would feel very protective. I would be like, I don't want an artist to interpret what my mother being killed was like. I don't want people to indulge in that it's like you know it's a bad idea right from the get-go yeah. uh but you're very drawn to find out as well yeah, i think i think we all are right yeah Again, and social media really plays off those weaknesses and that vulnerability to a certain extent but yeah. i don't think you ever get used to it yeah. but it is part of that life where you kind of have to well, at least certainly i was told this for many years it's just the way that it is you have to accept that they are going to write X, Y, Z about you. It's like, but what if it's not true? Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, just don't show them that you care. Because if you show them that you care, then they're going to do it more and more and more. It's like, so basically, you're screwed. Like, there's yeah. absolutely no way out of this. And so, yeah. Well, there is a way out, and you found it. I mean, you did it. Yeah, that's true. You would have never gone to the sand dunes with me. <laughs> that would have never happened. You realize that? Well, it, it still, it still hasn't happened. It happen. still hasn't happened yet. <laughs> if that's and it won't happen as long thing. as you've got the RF <laughs> flag on the side of your, your buggy. It ain't going to happen. So <laughs> I'll put. Uh, what would I don't you know, prefer? What, what, yeah, what do you yeah. want on there? What do you want on there? Oh, that's a good question. KFC logo? In, a, in and out logo. In and out logo. Ooh, I can yeah. do that. Yeah, I could have I could have that stickered up, no problem. Oh, yeah. Well, Harry, I've really, really liked talking to you. You're very charming. You're very intelligent. You're handsome, and I can't wait to see your torso. We're back, <laughs> <laughs> I say we're back to the, uh, the diary of torsos again. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank so, you much so much for coming. Yeah, for coming lovely. down. If I'd known we were going to be in a small little room above your garage, I wouldn't have come.
<laughs> exactly. We kept that especially, part quiet. Especially when there's a really nice uh, RV right part around the back. Why are we not in there? I came out. I was like, oh, this is nice. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. no we're, we're over here. there. It's like, yeah. what? In the building site. But you'll understand <laughs> this better than anyone, Harry. That is for my private life, and this is for my public life. What's in the RV then? A sex lair for my life. <laughs> <laughs> you name it, it's all in there. Well, thanks a million for coming down and doing this in person. It was really fun. Not at all. Nice to see you guys, and thanks for yeah. the laughs. So I just want to remind everyone that May 21st on Apple Plus, you should check out Oprah and Prince Harry's The Me You Can't See. I have to imagine it's similar to her book, which I just read, which is absolutely incredible, What Happened to You. So everyone should check out The Me You Can't See on Apple Plus May 21st. What a combo. I think like for The Me You Can't See, I encourage everybody to watch it, really, because what it will do is it will prove that you are not alone. And I think after the last four, 16 months, maybe more now, People are feeling really lonely. Well, like, now they're literally and figuratively alone. Yeah, you know? and, we're, and we're moving from the physical to the emotional, right? Physically, at the beginning of this pandemic, people were panicking, and there was that fight or flight, like, ah, what do we do? Like, lockdown, scared. Survival, yeah. Yeah, and now that the vaccines have been sort of, we're getting to the point where more and more people are being vaccinated, we're now in the emotional phase of what I read in the New York Times article is called languishing, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. It's like the it's the middle child between flourishing and depression. Yeah. Mm. And you just feel flat mm. and it's not depressed. It's definitely not flourishing. You lack the energy and the will, motivation. To your motivation, all that kind of stuff, because you're kind of sitting there going, well, what happens next? Yeah, you've yeah. lost momentum. Yeah, and I think it's really important that we talk about languishing, and it was a coined by someone, I can't remember who, but I think it was the journalist who wrote the story was Adam Grant. Um, oh, we talked uh, to him all Adam's the time. Adam's our best friend. Yeah. I did not know he came up with that. Or No, yeah, he didn't come up with it. Oh, okay. Someone else came up with it, but he wrote this, the most amazing article about languishing oh, and the fact that. that how important it is to be able to talk about it because, look, when it comes to mental health, what we need to realize and accept is that every single one of us have mental health. Yes. Right? The, yes. The, and then there's a varying the degrees, as we said. You've got the mental illness, and then you've got the sort of the, the awareness and the work that you can put in. Like, where do you want to be there? We shouldn't just sit there and go, oh, mental illness is once we are literally on the floor crawling around in the fetal position needing help. But for me, I don't think I need therapy anymore, but I want it. And when I say therapy, I mean actual therapy, sitting down and having a discussion with someone. But I also mean like nature, like going for walks, like throwing the ball for my dog down the beach and stuff like that. There are certain things around the world that are free, some you have to pay for, but ultimately go searching for the things that make you feel good about yourself. Like that's the key to life. Get rid of the bad stuff, get rid of the hate and just focus on the good. And your whole life turns around from that. Well, in this notion that there's a separation between mental health and your physical health is kind of comical because, like, I have psoriatic arthritis, and I'll tell you when my head's not right, lo and behold, I have a flare-up. If I have too much stress and I'm not dealing with it right, I have a fucking flare-up. So there's no division. Yeah. There's no division. It's your health, but I, but basically. I, but I also you know? hate, I hate this idea, and I was one of them. I fell for it, right? I didn't acknowledge that clearly what happened to me when I was 12 years old, losing my mom and all the other pieces that happened, the traumatic experiences that happened to me since then... I didn't acknowledge, well, perhaps maybe I need to deal with this. I need yeah, to process course, this because if yeah. I don't, how the hell am I going to be a decent father to my son and my daughter? Yeah. yeah. Like that awareness I didn't have then. Mm -hmm. But again, we've got what 14 experts as part of this series and the Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, who you probably we know. Yeah. She's Love absolutely her. fantastic. And she was talking about this concept of mental health being sort of public health, right? Yeah. Because the services are so limited. There's not enough money. Yeah. The problem is actually immense. How can we all help each other rather than this, oh, once I'm broken or once I'm suffering, I have to go here and there's not enough rooms or spaces for the amount of people or the, for the need. Yeah. When actually you can get ahead of it and work on the prevention by sharing and being more vulnerable with each other yeah. Yeah. and being able to process this grief or this loss or this trauma that every single one of us have, have experienced and will experience. Yeah. So anyone who's sitting there going, I don't have a problem and I never will have a problem, well, you probably are already contributing to the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you've probably got your blinkers on. You've probably created your own, own echo chamber. blinders in the US. <laughs> Blind, <laughs> blinders. Blinders. <laughs> um, so I think it's that. Yeah, That's certainly what sure. I've experienced for my own process, my own journey, my family and my friends and everybody else is anyone who thinks, oh, we're fine. You're the one who's like willing to talk about it. It's like, yeah, I'm willing to talk about it and talking about it 
has helped me heal. Yeah. Now I need to help you guys. Yeah. You know? And we're incentivized to do it because not dealing with it, there's all these predictable outcomes. There's health outcomes. There's incarceration outcomes. There's all these outcomes that we all pay for all downriver if we don't confront this stuff. And the financial element as well. Yeah. We're pouring money into all the, the downriver downstream. Shit. Yeah. When it's like, can we just focus upstream? Like yeah. we focus on one thing. Like to me, as I said to Oprah as well, one of the reasons that this whole thing started was two of the biggest issues that we're facing in today's world, I think, is the climate crisis and mental health. Mm -hmm. And they're both intrinsically linked. They are. And it's basically if we neglect our collective well-being, then we're screwed, Yeah. basically, because we can't look after ourselves, we can't look after each other, we can't look after each other, and we can't look after this home that we all inhabit. So it's all part of the same thing. Prince Harry, I don't say this lightly, I love you. Thanks for coming. This was great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. And now my favorite part of the show, the fact check with my soulmate, Monica Badman. This is a really rare, fun thing to do. Yeah. We're doing a fact check immediately after our guest left. Yes, which means... Mm. There are no facts, <laughs> but we just want to do a little debrief because how could we not after this guest? You, you got to debrief. Let's start with the obvious stuff. Pretty fucking cute in person. Oh, my God. So cute. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Were you on very the ropes? Very handsome. Yeah. Very, very handsome and charming. Very charming. Very yeah. tall. Very tall. Very good with his words. Yes. Lean. Also lean. Yeah. yeah. That's not your thing as much as mine, but I like it. <laughs> He was lovely. For me, uh, having not ever really consumed anything of his. Yes. Incredibly smart. Like, Very. Yeah. I was, I was pretty impressed. And we have to address the big elephant in the room. You're against the royals. Big time. Generally. <laughs> and not now, even, yeah. Now how I mean, do you feel? Now I love the royals. <laughs> now I, I support the monarchy. I think every country should be a monarchy. Okay, great. And I think everyone should inherit power just by being born. Okay, great. Yeah. No, um... I think the thing I wanted to say about this episode is I'm in a unique position right now where I'm surrounded by some Brits. Yes. And when the Oprah interview happened, I had missed it. But then I feel like I'm just making an excuse for myself. Um, I did watch it. That's the bottom line. Uh, all my friends had watched it and I wanted to talk to them about it. And I watched it. Yeah. I don't have a huge interest in that. Again, now I'm just making an excuse. I watched it. <laughs> And so when I watched it, and then I was talking to a friend of mine from England, and he had such a different opinion on that Oprah interview, yeah. like really different from mine, how he interpreted everything. And I found that confusing because this friend of mine is very, very intelligent and very thoughtful and very, he's just wonderful. Yeah. So it made me go like, huh, what else is at play here? And what I feel like I've come to is... I think we underestimate our own patriotism quite often, or at least I underestimate mine quite often. Like I, I'm an American. It's part of my identity. And so the analogy I thought of is I imagine that if a Chinese national had wooed one of the Obama daughters, be it Sasha or Malia, and then took them back to China to live forever, and then did interviews in China about inside workings of our evil capitalist system, I think I would be inclined to not like that guy. I think I would, some patriotism in me would just be like, fuck that guy and fuck, you know, what does he know about the Obamas mm -hmm. or, or our country? Yeah. So in that way, I think I've come to peace or understand why there's these pretty different views of this whole situation over here versus in England. Yeah. What is definitive, the, the real bad guy, in my opinion, of this whole story uh, is the tabloids. Yeah. They did side by side, Megan and Kate doing the same thing, holding their belly in public. Well, one was the sign of a doting mother. The other was an exactly. egomaniac. Yeah. Uh, eating avocado. They both ate avocado. <laughs> one was poisoning her kid. One was nourishing her kid. Like yeah. th this is stark. Clearly the tabloids were either motivated out of xenophobia or racism because yeah. the, the handling of those two ladies was polar opposite. That's exactly. kind of undeniable. Oh, yeah. And I think, I mean, that's in keeping with the ding, ding, ding with the whole episode. Yeah. The tabloids there are so extreme that, I mean, peek behind the curtain when we're figuring out this interview and I'm talking to his people and stuff like there's a big push 
to release this a little later. By the way, it is getting released a little later than it normally is. And that is because the British tabloids are going to have a frenzy. Mm. And it was told to us that that was going to happen. Like there's no like in the the off chance that the tabloids might say something. It's like, no, no, no. This is going to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. They're going to write all kinds of crazy stuff. They're going to write stuff about him and her and you. I might I might get blasted. Get used like (laughs) that's going to happen. And so we want to like hold the timing so that the American press can also have time as well. And I was like, oh, my God, the fact that they have to Consider. consider that just goes to show how deep this whole thing runs. I almost brought this up, but then I didn't. Um, when I was researching him and I typed his name in to get to some uh, biography of him, the news part st- pops up, right? Yeah. And I was looking at some of the headlines and I saw one of the headlines said, like, Prince Harry thinks this about his brother. So I clicked on it. Yeah. Come to find out, I read the fucking article. Uh, he said nothing to that effect. There is a royal expert. Oh, geez. That somehow knows how Harry feels. Oh, my God. And literally the headline says it as if Harry proclaimed it. Ugh. And I'm like, oh, my God, you have fu- – how embarrassing. Yeah. First of all, if you're a royal expert who fucking gets into the psychology of the royals, I, I think that's insane okay. that that's your specialty is uh, being clairvoyant on what uh, yeah. the royals think. Yeah. But it was printed as if he had said it. And you got to read to find out – oh, no, an expert, a royal expert has, has – uh, a random has figured person this, has, basically has figured has this out about uh-huh. how he feels. And I was like, oh, that level – you know, as much as you can complain about being an actor and a celebrity, that, that level's so different. Oh, that's why I I was talking to Callie before this interview and, you know, she just lived in London for a year. And she was like, when is that happening? And I was like, oh, in the next few days. And she was like, Monica, they're going to freak out in England. You you <laughs> don't understand. And I was yeah, like, really? Don't. I can't equate it. Like, I, it's not like any Brad celebrity Pitt. here. Yeah. It's... It's a mix of the biggest celebrity and the biggest politician. politician. Yeah. So you're mixing like a perfect storm. Yeah. He, she's like, there's just no, there's nothing like it here. Double whammy. It's a double whammy. It's a double entendre. It's a satisfizer. <laughs> and it is novel and proprietary. <laughs> but I was like, oh, wow. It's just so weird that it, it's on another level. Yeah. The attention. The attention. Given, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I'm really grateful that he took the time and me too he drove to our silly attic from fucking from far a few hours away <laughs> yeah and it was really fun i thought it was i liked it a lot me too we had had a previous argument about whether you had said to me listen you might have to call him the duke of sussex yeah and i said i, I won't do that yeah and then you said, don't be a fucking idiot, which you're right to say. And then I said, I can't not be me. I'm not going to call someone some fairy tale. It never came up. It never came up. Mm-hmm. I asked his person, his all set, her name is Toy, and she's lovely. Well, she said, should he just call you guys Dax and Monica? <laughs> and I said, yeah, unless he wants to give us some sort of royal title. I would like to be the Duke of Milford. Well, exactly. So... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the the Duchess of Duluth. Duluth. Duchess of oh, Duluth. Oh, that has a nice ring to it. It really does. Yeah. Okay. <gasps> I'm gonna start introducing you as the Duchess of Duluth <laughs> in our intros. Okay. okay. Oh, fuck. No, and it it can build like you know how they they have a lot of names. Yes. So it can yeah. be <laughs> yes. Monica, Duchess of Duluth, Miniature Mouse of, of Mongolia Street. Street. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, <laughs> well, he also has in addition to the title, he has six or seven names. By the way. No, you know, that's what I mean. Oh, but I mean like normal names. He's he's, he's like he he's like Harold, Mike, David. Oh, Pete, I, Frank. I yeah. It's part of the it, it, they has, get passed down names from the family, and then I know it's. He's a got whole, like seven first names. Yes. none of them being Harry. Well, that's <laughs> that was not his true. nickname. One of the, oh, you're right. Yeah, oh, but that, Harold. I don't right? think Harold was one of them. Really? No. Um. Wait, we have to look this up because. Oh, my God. You're right. Henry. Henry. They're using Harry for Henry. Oh, I like that. That's cute. But generally, the nickname for Henry is Hank. Yeah, I'm glad it's not Hank. Hank. Yeah, that doesn't have a good ring to it. It certainly doesn't. But anyway, she asked if we wanted to be called Dax and Monica. And I said, yeah, how should we refer to him? Mm -hmm. And I said, probably won't come up because we'll just be in person. We'll just be 
you. Um, and sh- and she said, I always say just like Prince Harry or Duke of Sussex, and he'll tell you immediately just to call him Harry. Oh, okay. but I let him do that. But it never came up with. Yeah. That never came up. Maybe you should have done it because then he could have shown that side of himself, his humility. It seemed really obvious he was very humble. So I didn't I didn't think I needed Wait, to. what's his name from? Henry? Uh-huh. What if you said, call me Henry? <laughs> we, were like, oh, we were almost there. So close. Like it was in between the full royal title yeah. and, and Harry. Well, once we like get closer, bros. I like an incremental intimacy. I wish he and Megan the longest, happiest marriage. And I'm glad that we got your foot in the door. Okay. In case I'm not going to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you live right across the street. I do. You paint like a pretty nice picture of what life could be like. I do. <laughs> well, I love you. I love you. That was really fun. Really fun. Are you glad I asked him about the crown? Yeah. Would you have asked him about the crown? No. Yeah. I was decidedly not asking him about the crown, but yeah. I'm glad you did. Well, I, I felt like I had cover fire because it was in your honor. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, course. if I loved it, I might not have asked yeah. about it. I got I to gotta get into it. You know, I have watched some episodes, and it's, it's a great show. It is so well done. The acting is so good. Olivia Coleman. Ooh, I wanted to point out one other thing, mm. but I didn't want to do it in front of him. I guess now I'm talking behind your back, Harry, but it's Henry. not my style, Henry. You know, someone else has left before as well. And do you know the why uncle, they left? Because of the marriage, yeah. To an American. I know. I know all about this because they is, talk about it on it's a big part of the crown. But isn't it wild that the two times people left their service, it was for American ladies? Yeah. Hey, American ladies, way to be powerful. That's why the, the English <laughs> don't like American ladies. ladies. <laughs> but yeah, good for American ladies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I I was shocked by that. I didn't know that history. I mean, I knew that a, a king had abdicated the, the throne. Yeah. Oh, I in. said his uncle. That's not right. His- it is his uncle. So his great grandfather came in. He was the one the king speaks. Yeah, exactly. And it was his brother who had abdicated. Exactly. So, so Charles's uncle. Yeah. So, um, so that's his Henry's great great uncle. Great great. Okay, or just yeah. great uncle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Really great uncle. <laughs> He's a great uncle. All right. I love you. Love you. 